Good evening, everyone. So this week, we are continuing our lecture series on dermatopathology, and we have discussed multiple dermal reaction patterns. And this week, the time has come to discuss spongiotic tissue reaction pattern. Now, uh, realize the basic concepts behind spongiosis. Spongiosis is one of the, uh, I would say, the easiest pattern to recognize. But remember that at multiple times, it can be very subtle. It can be a difficult uh, pattern to find out or a, maybe a difficult uh, pathological feature to look for. And you might require multiple sections or in fact, you have to examine the other sections on the slide so that you cannot, you should not miss spongiosis in one of the sections. So what essentially is spongiosis? Spongiosis is nothing but separation of keratinocytes because of edema or because of fluid deposition or extravasation of fluids. Okay. And uh, since we are talking about microscopic level, you have to examine other sections so that you don't miss it. Because sometimes the focus of spongiosis is not that thick. It's very thin. So you might miss it in one or two sections and you just have to examine multiple sections to find out the real extent or the presence of spongiosis. Now, why do we have spongiosis? There can be multiple reasons for spongiosis, but the end result is same. It is just intraepidermal edema or intraepidermal extravasation of fluids okay and because of the fluids the keratinocytes will move away from each other they will be separated out of a bit leaving behind little bit of you know uh, holes or little bit of transparent areas and it, the epidermis then looks like a sponge and that is why it is known as spongiotic tissue reaction pattern so let's discuss the various pathologies that uh, together show the features of spongiosis in a biopsy slide. And uh, remember, since spongiosis can be a very non-specific feature in a biopsy, for example, psoriasis in earlier stages can show spongiosis. Okay. So presence of spongiosis alone should not be given that much importance. It should be taken in accordance with other features that you see on a slide. Spongiosis along with multiple other features on the slide actually help you to make a better histopathological diagnosis okay so without much further ado let's start our discussion on spongiotic tissue reaction pattern now spongiotic tissue reaction pattern is also known as eczematous tissue reaction pattern because the most commonly uh, it is seen in eczema now eczema is a greek word that means to boil out to boil out we can translate it loosely to ooze out and what is oozing that is just extravasation of fluids so now you remember uh, that we told you about spongiotic tissue reaction pattern that there is extravasation of fluids in the epidermis and that is why in eczema which means to boil out so they essentially mean the same thing so eczematoid tissue reaction pattern or spongiotic tissue reaction pattern now what are the features of spongiotic tissue reaction pattern there is intraepidermal intracellular edema which we call it as spongiosis. So intraepidermal means inside the epidermis. Intracellular means within the uh, within two cells. Okay, so outside the cells, but inside the epidermis, and that is known as spongiosis. There is widened intercellular spaces. Why? Because fluid is getting collected in between them, and elongation of intercellular bridges. Now remember the histology of dermis. I've told you that the keratinocytes are attached to each other via desmosomes okay so these are desmosomes we'll show you a image on the next slide and a, sch a schematic representation on the next slide so normally the cells are attached to each other the keratinocytes are attached to each other with desmosomes okay but what happens if a fluid comes in between them and start to push them around so this blue area is fluid so if it keeps on getting collected it will push the cell around and so much so that they remain attached only at the point of desmosomes. Okay. And this attachment is known as intercellular, uh, the, is intercellular bridges. And they are elongated. Why? Because the cells are stretched out. So if two cells are there and two cells are stretching out, the attachment between them will be stretched. And that is what we mean by elongation of intercellular bridges. They can be parakeratosis because most of the time the oozy disorders show scales on clinical examination. And what is scales on clinical examination? When we do a biopsy, we see parakeratosis. Okay. 
they can be dilated blood vessels in the upper dermis because inflammation is going on. Let's move forward. So two theories were given why spongiosis occurs. The first is the osmotic gradient. That means something in the epidermis is pulling the fluid from the dermis. Okay, it is pulling. So osmotic gradient means pulling of fluid. Okay. The other theory says that there is increased hydrostatic pressure in the dermis. That means something is pushing the fluid from the dermis to the epidermis. So here you have pushing. In multiple disorders, the osmotic gradient could be more than hydrostatic pressure. Or in other disorders, hydrostatic pressure could be more than osmotic gradient. But more or less, these two are the, uh, are the driving forces that leads to accumulation of fluid inside the epidermis. Okay. So none of these theories are uh, sacrosanct. They are not uh, lines in stone. Okay. So both of these factors are at play at any given spongiotic disorder. Let's understand what we mean by spongiosis. So here we have keratinocytes. The green one are keratinocytes, while the blue one are the desmosomes or the connection between two keratinocytes. With spongiosis, what exactly happens is that fluid gets accumulated in between the cell. And as you can see that this fluid is pushing the boundaries of the cell around and the cells are only attached at the level of desmosomes. Okay. If there is significant edema, so what is what is accumulation of fluid? It is nothing but edema. Okay. So when there is significant edema, this small, small areas of, you know, transparent areas or white areas, they can coalesce together, come together to form a large spongiotic vesicle. Large spongiotic vesicle. Okay. So the inside cell might disintegrate because of inflammatory process. Or it could be just that the edema, the fluid is so much so that it has pushed all of the cells outside and there is a large vesicle in the center. Clear? Let's move forward. So this is a histopathological uh, specimen and you can see spongiosis. Let me just change the color. And you can see this kind of empty spaces here. Can you see these empty spaces? Look at this intercellular empty spaces. This is nothing but spongiosis. Okay. You can see a bit of normal, normal architecture here of the epidermis. You can see a bit of normal epidermis. But look at this pale keratinocytes. Why pale? Because there's a lot of fluid around it. And all of this fluid is pushing the cells around. And that is nothing but spongiosis. Okay. Let's see a magnified image on the next slide. And look at this beautiful image from Vedans. Okay, it's on page 122. If you want, you can look at Vedans fifth edition. And look at this spongiotic vesicle. Or look at this good amount of spongiosis. Now, why it is empty? Because during processing, the fluid gets washed off and you only see the empty spaces. And these are the intracellular bridges. Can you see? This is a large, uh, or not large, this is not just a normal keratinocyte. And it's attached to other keratinocytes via, via desmosomes. And when it is stretched out, these bridges get elongated. So you can easily appreciate the elongation of intracellular bridges. So now I've made myself clear. What do we mean by elongation of intercellular bridges? Now this is a bit different from the spinous process that we see in stratum spinosum. That is just because of attachment of the cells at the level of desmosomes and the cells have shrunken up. Okay. And when the cells shrunken up, the distance between the two cells will remain the same. So let me tell you, let me just tell you what I mean actually. If these two are, let's say, keratinocytes, and if they shrink up, they will take up the, the space would be nearly same. Okay. But if they spongiosis, they can be pushed to a larger degree and they will be stretching of the bridges. So the space would be increased. And that is the difference between the spinous layer, the morphology of keratinocytes and spinous layer, and what we see in spongiosis. In spongiosis, the spongiosis can affect all the layers of the epidermis. Okay, while the spinous is only a part of epidermis. Clear? So that is what we mean by elongation of intercellular bridges. Let's move forward. So essentially, Whedon's describe six patterns of spongiosis. Okay. There are different 
articles, uh, different uh, literature that gives you more patterns. But six essential patterns are there. And these are neutrophilic spongiosis, eosinophilic spongiosis, malarial or acrosyringeal spongiosis in which the spongiosis is restricted to the sweat ducts. Follicular spongiosis where it is restricted to hair follicle. Vitraciform spongiosis in which the inflammatory cells are multi-lineage. That means lymphocytes are there, histocytes are there, Langerhans cells are there. Okay, so if there are multiple cells inside the spongiotic vesicle, it is pitraciform and most of the disorders show scales on clinical examination. So pitraciform spongiosis, pitriasis means uh, scaly and haphazard spongiosis which has a lot of different kind of uh, uh, histopathological features and they are grouped together with haphazard spongiosis. Okay, so essentially six patterns, neutrophilic, eosinophilic, malarial, follicular, pitraciform and haphazard. Clear? Let's move forward. So if you divide spongiosis into these patterns, it will be easier to remember example of spongiosis. You just have to remember 2 to 3, 3 each pattern and you can easily remember 15 to 18 uh, disorders of showing spongiotic tissue reaction pattern. So with that, we'll start our discussion on spongiotic tissue reaction pattern, starting first with neutrophilic spongiosis. So again, to recapitulate that we have six patterns of spongiosis. We have the first one, neutrophilic, eosinophilic, malarial, follicular, pitraciform, and haphazard. So essentially, these are the six patterns that we see in spongiosis. Let's start. The first is neutrophilic spongiosis. In this spongiosis, we see majorly the neutrophils as the inflammatory cells. And I've told you before that wherever there's acute injury, neutrophils will come first. So this is predominantly seen in acute disorders. Okay, acute disorders. If the migration of neutrophils is a lot, okay, if it is very severe, then we term it as pustular dermatitis or spongiform pustular dermatitis and that is seen in severe disorders, severe intensity. So if you have a vesicle and you have few neutrophils, it is neutrophilic exocytosis. But you have a vesicle and you have a lot of eosinophils, sorry, a lot of neutrophils. A lot of neutrophils. And collection of neutrophils is pustule. Remember, where they, wherever there is pus, there are neutrophils. So this is known as pustular dermatitis. Clear? It just depends on the severity. So look at this representation, look at this biopsy slide, okay. This is the spongiotic vesicle, let me change the color, yeah. This is the spongiotic vesicle here. There are smaller spongiotic vesicles in this entire area and if you look quite closely, you will see that the cells inside the vesicles are actually neutrophils, okay. You can see the cells with their multi-lobe nucleus. It looks like a neutrophil, like here. So, you can easily see that inside the spongiotic vesicles, you have predominantly neutrophilic infiltration. So, you see neutrophil and that is what we see in neutrophilic spongiosis. Okay, let's move forward. So, so the example of neutrophilic dermatosis or neutro, sorry, neutrophilic spongiosis are those disorders which are intensely inflammatory and they are acute in origin. And we we uh, we simple or not we, uh, we could say that we can explain neutrophilic spongiosis using the prototype of pedrus dermatitis or blister dermatitis. Okay, so it is nothing but vesicular dermatitis. That means inflammation of skin in which there are vesicles, along with neutrophilic spongiosis. So these two things are there in pedrus dermatitis. It is caused by an irritant substance known as pederin. And it's a toxic alkaloid. So what essentially happens is, pederin is a substance that is found in the hemocele of insects of the genus Pederus. That's why it's known as Pederus dermatitis. Notice the spelling. Okay, I have been writing it wrongly for many years before realizing that this is the actual spelling of Pederus dermatitis. So it belongs to the hemocele of insects in the genus Pederus in the order Cleoptera not Cleopatra, it's Cleoptera, okay. 
and this is a toxic substance. So whenever the fluid comes in contact with the skin, it will lead to an acute inflammatory reaction leading to blister dermatitis or pedros dermatitis. What exactly happens is there is neutrophilic spongiosis which leads to vesicle formation and if the inflammation is severe, then it leads to reticular necrosis of the epidermis. That means the epidermis is so damaged that now it is undergoing necrosis. And the necrosis can involve all the layers starting from the top and it may even involve the lowest most layer of the suprabasal keratinocytes. And you can see suprabasal necrosis in severe petrous dermatitis. Let's move forward. So look at this intense blister dermatitis reaction. I've taken it from McKee's Skin Pathology 4th edition, page 12. So look at this whole area, the whole epidermis. So here the inflammation is somewhat milder with only little little follicles, in, uh, sorry, little little spongiotic vesicles. In fact, this area is also severely affected. But look at this huge vesicle, this huge spongiotic vesicle. And clinically, this will look like vesicles and blisters. Okay, and it all has a clear fluid and if you analyze it on a higher magnification, you will realize that the cells in between them are actually neutrophils. Okay, neutrophils. Clear? So, an, an example of neutrophilic spongiosis is blister dermatitis. Let's move forward. Now, these are the disorders that will show neutrophilic spongiosis. Okay, so you have pustular psoriasis, again pustules are there. Remember psoriasis in early lesions can show spongiosis and if it is of the pustular variety, it will show neutrophilic spongiosis. Prudico pigmentosa, reactive arthritis, pemphigus foliaceus, Ig pemphigus, herpetiform pemphigus. I will, I'm not going to read everything. Staphylococcal skin, scalded, sorry, toxic shock syndrome, dermatophytes. Remember, any acute infection will have nukes. Okay, Candidios, candidosis. Pedros dermatitis, we have explained as a prototype. Pustular contact dermatitis, wherever there are pustules, there are neutrophils. Okay. A microbial pustulosis of the folds. So these are all disorders. Remember, if you hear pustular, acute vesicles, remember you are dealing with neutrophilic spongiosis. Okay. And if you remove pustula, then you are just dealing with plain spongiosis. But if you have pustula, you are dealing with neutrophilic spongiosis. And all of these disorders, for example, the pemphigus group of disorders, they are uh, described under vesicobullous reaction pattern. But in the early stages, they can show spongiotic tissue reaction pattern. Now remember, what are vesicobullous reactions? What are vesicles? They are a collection of spongiotic vesicles. When they come together, they become a large vesicle. And when this, this large vesicle is increased in intensity, it will lead to separation of epidermis, leading to vesicobullous reaction pattern. So remember that all vesicobullous reaction pattern, all vesicobullous reaction pattern, in the initial stages, starts with spongiosis in the very early stage okay so spongiotic tissue reaction pattern can be seen easily in a disorder which you suspect it to be vesicobullous let's move forward the second type is eosinophilic spongiosis and in eosinophilic spongiosis you will see eosinophils so these are this is a schematic representation of eosinophils. The cytoplasm is intensely red staining. It is highly eosinophilic, so they are difficult to miss. The nucleus is bilobe, but it is not that basophilic, and you can easily differentiate it from neutrophils because the cytoplasm is differently colored, and the these lobes are only two, not more than two, while neutrophils can have two to six. So in pemphigus, pemphigus vegetans, herpetiform pemphigus, bullous pemphigoid. Remember, eosinophils are a good part of the inflammatory infiltrate in bullous pemphigoid. Okay. Cicatricial pemphigoid, herpes gestation is okay. Uh, ACDs, if there's allergic contact dermatitis, uh, in atopic dermatitis where you have high eosinophil count, arthropod bites, because you know where they are in, uh, they are, why are why are we having eosinophils? We are having eosinophils because parasites have to be taken care of. Okay. So arthropod bites, eosinophilic folliculitis like Ophugis disease. In the first stage of IP, incontinentia pigmenti. Okay, so you can see eosinophils there. 
let's move forward so look at this area okay look at this focus mm -hmm. look at this focus so this is a large spongiotic vesicle isn't it and inside the vesicles if you can zoom out and see for example if you can see this cell it has a red cytoplasm and other cells also have eosinophilic red cytoplasm and it is nothing but collection of eosinophils inside a spongiotic vesicle and that is known as eosinophilic spongiosis we are clear on that if you have neutrophils you are you are dealing with neutrophilic spongiosis if you have eosinophils you are dealing with eosinophilic spongiosis let's move forward Now this specimen is taken from a pemphigus foliaceous lesion, okay, pemphigus foliaceous lesion and early lesion, so early precursor of pemphigus foliaceous, okay, and you can see a little bit of spongiosis elsewhere also, this is milder in variety, there is spongiosis, there is separation of fluid, sorry, separation of layers, and you can also observe that the separation is predominantly at the upper level. Why? Because pemphigus foliaceous, the separation occurs at the upper, upper layers of epidermis. And you may have eosinophils, these are all red colored cells. They are not as blue as neutrophils, they are, these are all red colored cells. And this red colored cells is nothing but eosinophils inside a large spongiotic vesicle which you can see in the precursor lesion of pemphigus foliaceous. Now remember, in early lesion of pemphigus foliaceous, you can also see neutrophils. So don't worry about it. If you see a vesicle, just make a mention of what cells you are seeing inside the vesicles. Okay, that's all you have to do. But remember that both of these cells can be apart in the earlier lesions of pemphigus group of disorders. Clear? Let's move forward. Now look at this spongiotic drug eruption. This slide from spongiotic drug eruption. You can in fact see eosinophils here. Okay, you can see all those red colored cells. Look at this eosinophil, eosinophil, eosinophil. We are clear about it. Now, you can see milder spongiosis involving nearly all the layers of the epidermis. In fact, there is a little bit of spongiosis above, a little bit of separation of stratum corneum. But the spongiotic foci, you can easily see that this mild spongiosis with an inflammatory infiltrate in the upper dermis composed pre, uh, majorly of eosinophils. So this is what you see in spongiotic drug eruption. Okay, so this is all spongiosis happening at the basal level. Let's move forward. The third type is malarial spongiosis where the spongiosis is around the sweat ducts. Around the sweat ducts. So intraepidermal spongiosis centered around the sweat ducts, okay? Acrosyringium, that's the name that we use for sweat ducts. And clinically, we see it in a disorder, in group of disorders known as miliaria. Okay, so miliaria, and these are the different types of miliaria. You have crystallina or alba. You have rubra, which is commonly known as prickly heat. You have pustulosa, in which there are multiple pustules, and profunda. Okay, in crystallina or alba, it is weak asymptomatic vesicles and the obstruction occurs at the level of stratum corneum. So a bit more superficial, upper layer of epidermis. It is self-limiting. So if you just push a vesicle of miliaria crystallina, only clear fluid will come out. There is no itching, there is no symptoms. Okay. In miliaria rubra, there are erythematous pruritic papular vesicles. So you can have papules and these papules are itchy. They can also be seen in type 1 pseudo aldosteronism. I'm just mentioning it because the books mention it, but most of the time we see when there's intense exposure to heat or intense uh, sweating. And because of intense sweating, the inflammation around the sweat ducts happen, and that inflammation leads to spongiosis initially. And that is what we see in Milaria rubra. In, mil in Milaria pustulosa, you have intense inflammation leading to migration of other inflammatory cells like neutrophils, and you have pustule formation. In that, instead of having uh, pruritic papules or vesicles, you have pruritic pustules. In profunda, you have flesh-colored papules because the obstruction is deep at the level of DEG. Now remember, if this is a skin and this is the acrosyringium and this is the gland, okay? If an obstruction happens a bit distally, 
at the end, you will only see accumulation of sweat. So this will be a clear vessel. But if, and this is dermoepidermal junction, okay. If an obstruction happens at the level of DEG, and this whole area gets swollen up because of the obstruction, this whole area is swollen up, it will push the skin up. And that is why you see skin colored papules. Okay, so it's a much more deeper inflammation in Miraria profunda. We are clear about it. So, Crystallina, Robra, Pustulosa, Profunda. Just remember that as you go from uh, asymptomatic to deeper obstruction. Obstruction in Miraria profunda is a dermoepidermal junction. Let's move forward. So, in histopathology, when we biopsy a lesion of malaria, we, if we are biopsying a lesion of crystallina, also known as malaria alba, the vesicles can be seen within or directly below stratum cornea. Okay, you will have an orthokeratotic layer above the vesicle and a normal basket weave keratin below. A past positive plug may be seen. In rubra, you will have variable spongiosis and spongiotic vesiculation, but now some inflammatory cells are also coming. Why? Because it is erythematous. Erythema means red. Red means inflammation. So, inflammatory cells have to be there and you have lymphocytes that can may or may not be present. In pustulosa, you have predominantly neutrophils that come below the stratum corneum. Okay. It can also affect the epidermal sweat duct. So, remember wherever there is pustules, there are neutrophils. Okay. And in profunda, you will have more pronounced edema where the vesiculation is seen at the dermoepidermal junction. So, we are clear about it at the dermoepidermal junction. That is why it is much more profound. So, malaria profunda. Let's move forward. So, look at this area you know, of the biopsy. Okay. So, this, this area is associated with a sweat duct. This area is associated with a sweat duct. You can in fact see the duct here. Okay, so this is a duct. And you can see that the focus of spongiosis is localized around the ducts, around the acrosyringium. And that is what is known as malaria, uh, sorry, uh, malarial spongiosis. Okay, let's move forward. This is a better representation. You, in fact, you can see the keratin plug here in malaria rubra. So, this is the biopsy taken from malaria rubra and I have taken these pictures from Vedans and you can see this, this is the lumen of the acrosyringium. So, this is a duct which is coiling inside the epidermis. In a cross section, you will only see holes. And in this focus, you can see little bit of empty spaces and this is nothing but spongiosis. And this spongiosis is restricted around the sweat ducts. So, malarial spongiosis. Now, look at this here. In fact, this little pink area is actually again lumen of the duct. Lumen of the duct. And this whole inflammatory and spongiotic focus is centered around the sweat ducts. So, malarial spongiosis is confirmed. Now, look at this pustule. Look at this collection of neutrophils. Look at this huge collection, a little bit of microapsis formation and it is filled with neutrophils. All of these cells are blue looking. Remember, eosinophils are red, neutrophils are blue. So, this whole blue looking pustule is nothing but a neutrophilic collection centered around an acrosyringium with spongiosis around the acrosyringium and you make a diagnosis of malaria pustulosa. Clear? Let's move forward. The fourth type that we'll discuss now is follicular spongiosis, in which the spongiosis occurs around the hair follicle, okay, around the hair follicle apparatus. So, you see intercellular edema in the follicular infundibulum. We're clear on that. <clears throat> the disorders that show follicular spongiosis are infundibular folliculitis, follicular lesions of atopic dermatitis, Hypopigmenting dermatitis, which is somewhat of a newer entity, not exactly new, it has been known for quite some time. But the earliest feature that you can see are the follicular spongiosis. Apocrine malaria, remember we discussed apocrine malaria, uh, we mentioned apocrine malaria when, while discussing normal crime malaria. Eosinophilic folliculitis, because follicular inflammation is there. Let's move forward, forward and understand infundibular folliculitis. 
So this may look a bit like malarial spongiosis because you are not seeing the entire picture. But when you see the entire biopsy, you will realize that this focus of spongiosis is limited to follicle. In fact, this area is a follicular plug. You will see only one area where the shaft is coming out. You will not see that multiple lumens that we were seeing of the acrosyringia. And you can see that this sponge, let me change the color. You can see that this spongiosis is limited to the follicle. This area is normal. This area is normal. Okay. And you can see that this spongiosis is restricted to the follicular area. Here, I'll just remove all the markers so that you can actually appreciate the spongiosis localized at the level of follicles. Okay. Let's move forward. So let's discuss follicular spongiosis while discussing infundibular folliculitis or inflammation of the infundibulum of the hair. Okay. It is also known as disseminate and recurrent infundibular folliculitis of H. and Lund. Mostly seen in African American people. Follicular, often pruritic papillary eruption predominantly over trunk and proximal extremities. So, central area of the body is affected along uh, as follicular itchy papules. When you do a biopsy, you will see spongiosis of the follicular infundibulum with lymphocyte exocytosis. So, more of a lymphocytic inflammation. So, remember, uh, this kind of disorders can also be clubbed in lymphocytic exocytosis. But since this spongiosis, is centered around the follicle, it's better to label it as a part of follicular spongiosis. There is widening of the follicular ostium because of inflammation and focal parakeratosis is seen at the edge of the ostium. It can resemble atopic dermatitis, the follicular lesions of atopic dermatitis, but you may have a little bit more of eosinophils in atopic dermatitis. Okay, so let's move forward. So look at this picture showing infundibular folliculitis. So, this is the keratin plug. Okay, this is the keratin plug or the follicular plug. And this is the spongiosis centered around a follicle. So, you can see that the adjacent epidermis is normal. Okay, so this is normal. This is normal. And it, the spongiosis, the empty vesicles are centered around the follicles. Clear? Let's move forward. The fifth type that we'll discuss now is petrasiform spongiosis. Petrasiform spongiosis. In this spongiosis, you have microvesicles, but they have other inflammatory cells also. You have lymphocytes, you have histiocytes, you have Langerhans cells. And a lot of these disorders show scaling. Okay, so petrasi means scales. Petrasiform spongiosis. So you have a lot of scaling. You can see scaling in other disorders, uh, other disorders and the other patterns of spongiosis, but in this pattern you will see scales. So you have petrasiform, sorry, petriasis rosea, petrasiform drug reaction, erythemanular centrifugum, pneumular dermatitis in some cases, and slightly uncommon but also seen in lichen striatus. Let's move forward to understand what exactly is petrasiform spongiosis. So, the prototypic example is Petrasis rosea. It is also known as an invisible dermatosis. Why? But because clinically, you will see, uh, clinically, it's, it's a bit easier to make a diagnosis of Petrasis rosea. We know the fur tree pattern appearance of the uh, erythematous oval scales. We see a um, uh, herald patch over the trunk. All of these things, it's, it's a bit easier to make a diagnosis of Petrasis rosea clinically. But when you do a biopsy, you see all the non-specific biopsy features. So, this is an example of invisible dermatosis in which biopsy is not going to help you that much. But wherever there are features, how to correlate that biopsy features to your clinical examination. Okay. The epidermis is vaguely undulating with focal parakeratosis. Remember, wherever you have scales, you will have parakeratosis. Okay. Focal parakeratosis, so much so that it can form parakeratotic mounds. So, just go back and see the video on psoriasiform tissue reaction pattern and you will easily understand what do we mean by a parakeratotic mound. See the segment on uh, Petrasis rubra pilaris and you will understand what do you mean by mound. There is diminished granular layer with focal spongiosis. So, what exactly is happening is that there is altered keratinization and whenever there is altered keratinization, the granular layer would be decreased 
Why? Because the cells are not able to form good granules and if they don't have good granules, they will not have a good granular layer. And the cells are not being able to make granules, they are not able to mature themselves properly. Immature cells will reach stratum corneum. And what do we mean by immature keratinocytes? Keratinocytes that have nucleus in them. And what do we call when we see nucleus inside the cells in stratum corneum? We call it as parakeratosis. Okay. So, decreased granular layer and increased parakeratosis are both features of altered keratinization. Third keratinization. Okay. There is lymphocyte exocytosis within spongiotic vesicles and this is characteristic. You will see more of a lymphocytic spongiosis. In the herald patch, you can see these keratotic cells. In the papillary dermis, there is edema and homogenization of collagen. And RBC extravasation at the upper layers can be visible in multiple sections. In, so in petraciform drug reaction, you will see more of eosinophils. We all know that eosinophil migration is more in drug reactions. We already, I have already shown you a picture of spongiotic drug reaction which had more eosinophils. So in petraciform drug reaction, you will see features of petraciform spongiosis but with more eosinophils. Okay, let's move forward. So look at this a bit hazy but uh, good enough histopathology of petriasis rosea. Okay. And here you can see the parakeratotic mound. Mound means a small hill. Okay. So a hill of parakeratosis. You can see a focus of spongiosis. Okay. So these are all foci of spongiosis. And that's what you see in Petraciosia. If you miss the parakeratotic mound, if you see the mild, if you miss the mild spongiosis, you can easily miss Petraciosia, hence invisible dermatosis. So you have to look for it. The last pattern is other spongiotic reaction. We have told you that other spongiotic reaction is just a variant of uh, haphazard spongiotic reaction. So we will discuss them together, other spongiotic reaction pattern. And it includes all the forms of dermatitis like irritant contact dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, incontinentia pigmentitis, stasis dermatitis, phototoxic dermatitis, photoallergic dermatitis and this is not an exhaustive list. There are a lot of different disorders that come into it. If you open Whedon's and look into it, there's a whole page dedicated to examples of spongiotic tissue reaction pattern and you have nearly one fourth to one third of a page only showing uh, examples of other spongiotic reaction. Okay, so we will not uh, discuss each of them in details because uh, disorders like dermatitis actually warrant a good detailed discussion while disorders like incontinentia pigmenta is better discussed elsewhere. Okay, just a little bit of adjustment, yeah. Okay, let's come back. So let's discuss each of these disorders, okay? Let's discuss each of these disorders one by one. So this is an irritant contact dermatitis and it shows epidermal necrosis. Look at this area. There is so such a severe destruction in the upper layers of epidermis. Upper layer, why? Because contact has happened, so it has to be upper layer. You can see neutrophils. You can can you appreciate the bilobed nature? Sorry, multi-lobed nature of these cells. Look at this. Look at this beautiful neutrophil layer. There are also few lymphocytes. If you look closely, you can see an eosinophil here. Okay, so multiple cells are there. It's a mixed cell, upper epidermal spongiotic vesicle seen in ICD, and the destruction is so extreme that it is causing epidermal necrosis. Let's move forward. Here it is a magnified picture showing a spongiotic vesicle and you can easily appreciate neutrophils, neutrophils, lymphocytes, neutrophils, lymphocytes, neutrophils. So multiple cells are there. Remember, if you understand a bit about immunity, the first cell to come at a, at a, at a focus of inflammation are the neutrophils. And as the disorder moves from acute to chronic, the cell population will change from neutrophils to lymphocytes. Okay. And when we say mixed cell, 
for example, in mixed cell granular matrix reaction or, or a mixed cell infiltrate, what we are essentially mean is that acute and chronic both types of inflammation are present. And acute is symbolized by neutrophils and chronic is symbolized by lymphocytes. If you see both of them together, you may label it as mixed cell inflammatory reaction. So in irritant contact dermatitis, both of these are happening. And you see multiple lineage inflammatory cells inside the vesicle. Let's move forward. So here the destruction of the epidermis is so severe that the vesicles have come together to form a large cleft. The epidermis is essentially separate from the dermis now. Okay. At this part of the section, also you can see the cleft. So that is just a severe and intense form of ICD leading to epidermal clefting. And at this level, you will see bulla, not so much as vesicles, but uh, this kind of epidermal damage usually leads to good amount of necrosis. You can in fact appreciate a little bit of finding hair and it shows pale keratinocytes, paler keratinocytes and that is just because of inflammation of the keratinocytes. Let's move forward. So in, in this biopsy picture, you can see this focus of, let me change the color again, yeah. You can see the focus of spongiosis right here. Okay, and inside this focus spongiosis, you can appreciate the presence of lymphocytes, dark stained cell with a large nucleus nearly occupying the whole cell area or the cell volume. Okay, so, so lymphocytic spongiosis and in fact, it will also show a little bit of eosinophils. In this particular section, you are not able to see eosinophils clearly, but in the next slide, I will show you some eosinophils with lymphocytes. So, in allergic contact dermatitis, you will have more of eosinophils and uh, lymphocytic exocytosis or lymphocytic spongiosis, presence of these two major cells in this spongiotic vesicle. Okay, so here you can see such a beautiful eosinophils along with a lymphocyte at the, at the, as a part of inflammatory infiltrate. And in this, see, th this image I have taken from Vedans and you can appreciate this red colored cells. You can see the red colored cells with two lobe nuclei, red colored, red colored, red colored. These are nothing but eosinophils inside the spongiotic vesicle and that you see in allergic contact dermatitis. Now, there are a few others who will say that in ICD, the spongiosis is more in the upper layers, while in ACD, the sponge is more in lower layer because that is where the inflammation is arising from. That is not a good way to uh, differentiate because by the time the patient comes to you, these features can be panepidermal. It, they can be in any layers of the epidermis. So it is important that we should not differentiate just based on the location of spongiosis. It's better to differentiate if you see predominantly or majorly eosinophils, then you make a diagnosis towards allergic contact dermatitis. Let's move forward. So this is a feature of uh, or a slide showing atopic dermatitis. In fact, you can appreciate eosinophils here, eosinophils, 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 some RBC extravasation this is the focus of spongiosis and in atopic dermatitis you will see lymphocytes and eosinophils as the major cellular parts in the spongiotic vesicle that is what the inflammation leading to other thing that you can notice is slight pallor of keratinocytes and that we see when there's an inflammatory process going on the keratinocytes are not able to collect as much keratohyalin granules to form that kind of basophilic structure that we usually associate with epidermis it is more of a pallor and that pallor is also increased by intraepidermal edema. That is what is happening in spongiosis. There is edema and because of edema, it looks a more diluted, shaded picture, a, a little bit of, you know, less contrast picture. That is only because of pallor of keratinocytes, okay, and edema, okay. So that is what we see in atopic dermatitis at the level of epidermis. A lot more is going on at the level of dermis. So we will not discuss them because atopic dermatitis itself will require a good amount of discussion on the biopsies of atopic dermatitis. Okay. So let's move forward. Just understand that you will see more of a lymphocytic uh, and eosinophilic predominant spongiotic vesicle. Let's move forward.
Now what is happening here? Look at this humongous vesicle. Humongous vesicle with predominantly lymphocytic infiltrate and this is nothing but a biopsy of pomphilix. Look at this thick stratum corneum. So most likely from palm. Most likely. Okay, most likely from the palm or aspect. And what you are seeing here is a large spongiotic vesicle seen in pomphilix. So much so inflammation concentrated at one focus leading to a large vesicle formation filled with inflammatory cells and fluid and fibrin exudates fibrin exudates this whole empty area is nothing but fluid which got washed away during processing and this is how a pomphilix will look under a microscope this is another picture of pomphilix this i have taken from mckees and look at this large humongous vesicle and in this this biopsy picture you can easily appreciate the inflammatory cells you can see red colored eosinophils here you can see a few neutrophils in between this is an eosinophil this is a neutrophil eosinophil most of the time during the initial examination of biopsy slide it becomes difficult to analyze what cells are there don't worry just keep on looking at the slides the more you look the more you will understand uh, even even uh, Think of the most accomplished, biggest dermatopathologist that you can think of. And even they might have problems in, in analyzing what are the cells inside. So don't worry. Especially at this magnification, it would be tough. When you're looking at biopsy, it's much more clearer. And you can go to larger magnification to be sure of your findings. But you can easily appreciate that at least there are inflammatory cells inside the spongiotic vesicles so that you can zoom out go into higher magnification at 40x or something and look at those cells clear if required go to 100x don't worry but look at slides clear let's move forward so this is a dermatophyte infection now remember if you see spongiosis centered around the upper layers of epidermis and there is an intense neutrophilic collection around it. Think of a parasite. What exactly is happening? Inflammation is happening. That is why there is spongiosis. What exactly is happening? Neutrophils are there. So that is why there is pustule formation. Now, intense inflammation, pustule formation involving the upper layer of epidermis, think that something is attacking from the outside to the inside of the body. Clear? Now, when you see as a neutrophilic spongiotic vesicle involving the upper layers that is stratum corneum or just at the level of stratum corneum try to find if you can find some hyphae or at least spores because these are the most common uh, reasons for a spongiotic neutrophilic vesicle so here you can see a well circumscribed neutrophilic spongiosis and it involves the upper layer of epidermis, the stratum corneum or just at the level of stratum corneum. And you can in fact appreciate, I don't want to draw otherwise it will cloud it. Look at this area, just a second. Look at this area. These are all, these are the hyphae of the fungus. So dermatophytic hyphae. So whenever you see spongiosis and neutrophils in the upper layer of the epidermis, search for hyphae, search for spores. Okay, let's move forward. So with that, we finish our discussion on spong uh, spongiotic tissue reaction pattern. And again, the reading recommendations would be IDVL textbook of dermatopathology and fundamentals of pathology of skin. But remember, always, if you want to understand dermatopathology, look at the slides. Nothing beats the slides. Look and discuss the slides. Okay. Uh, one more area where I would like to plug my own name is that in this book, I will textbook of dermatopathology, the chapter on spongiotic tissue reaction is written by, by Vishal Sir and me. So if you want to just go through this chapter, it's a beautiful chapter, very beautiful photographs. And we have utilized a different uh, different classification of spongiotic reaction pattern. Most we are discussing more on acute, subacute, chronic, because that's how we see different features. But we have used the the uh, prior classification of eosinophilic, neutrophilic, enzymatic disorders. So you'll you'll be able to learn a bit about 
how to classify spongiosis, how to actually look for features, different features inside a spongiotic vesicle. So all of this, palmoplantosaur acid, dermatophytosis, P. rosea, EAC, ELBA, hypopigmenting dermatitis, this new entity is discussed there, which shows follicular spongiosis, malaria, all of the disorders have been discussed in detail and uh, just a shameless plug. So get this book and read this chapter. And with that, the reading recommendation remains the same. Uh, although if you go through this lecture, you don't require uh, reading much about it because it covers the basics of spongiotic uh, reaction pattern. And we also have included a lot of biopsy pictures. I think this lecture has the maximum amount of histopathology pictures so that we can understand that spongiosis in itself is not a, an important finding, but when you combine it with different findings, it becomes so important that you can easily make a better understanding about the disorder. So, Vedans, okay, where is the picture? Vedans, Fundamentals of Pathology, I do a textbook on Dermatopathology, Pathology Outlines, very good resource, and Mickey's Dermatopathology, 4th edition. So, with that, I'll finish this week's lecture. It was, it was a long lecture. But uh, we have completed yet again another tissue reaction pattern and we are left with two more lectures. We are left with vesicobullous reaction pattern and we are left with sclerosing reaction pattern. Okay. And with that, we will finish the first series of lectures on dermatopathology. And I would like to change the gears and shift into some other topics so that uh, I can take a break from reading about dermatopathology. And uh, without much further ado, I will not take much of your time. And we'll finish this lecture. Any comments, just comment below the video. I read the comments. I may be late, but I do reply to each of them. And any doubts, any suggestions, any queries, use the timestamp and mention it in the comments. I'll answer them. Okay. So thank you for staying till now. And enjoy all your day. We'll meet next week again with a newer video. Till then, adios and bye-bye.